Welcome to the Third Row Tesla podcast. This is Safian Fraval. This is a really special episode. We've got um, a really special guest. I think you're going to really enjoy it. So we've got our third row crew. We've got Omar Kazi, Tesla Truth. Boom. And we've got Kristen, K10. Hey. And then we got our special guest, the one and only George Hotz. How you doing, George? Pretty good. Excellent, man. So yeah, today we're just going to cover a bit about uh, George and autonomous driving, maybe cover a bit of his background and, and some of the future stuff. So, uh, so George, I, I've actually uh, I've been a huge fan for a long time. I actually was just saying that I had Lime Brain running on my, on my iPhone. I think it was like a 3GS <laughs> way back in the day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just like, how, did you ever see yourself go from, from there to where you are now? I mean, how'd you get started? Like, how'd you get started programming and like hacking? You know, the same way everyone else did. Um, but with respect to like how you go from that to this, it's the same thing. What's really the difference between jailbreaking a phone and jailbreaking a car? Sure. Yeah, true. That's an interesting way to look at it. I mean, it was it was the jailbreakers that really drove forward the uh, people. Jailbreakers had apps on, on the iPhone before the App Store. Were there going to be apps? Were there going to be installer apps that ran on the device? Remember ActiveSync back in the day? Uh, you download the app on the computer. You have to download it. All in place installer apps. I mean, would have it happened? Maybe. I don't know. Steve Jobs was saying it was all going to be HTML5. Right. Uh, the sweet solution. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is the same thing, right? And it probably would have happened no matter what, but it's a question about where it happens first and, you know, who has control. So your approach has been a little bit different. I mean, I'd love to hear about the uh, interviews. You said you had two interviews with Elon, right? Mm -hmm. For Tesla. I'd love to hear more about that and then how it turned into what you're doing now. So a friend of mine, we were working at this company, uh, and uh, he approached me to, to talk with Elon about building a vision system for autopilot, building a replacement for the mobile iChip. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's, the mobile iChip wasn't very good. Uh, you, I saw like a UI that was bringing up like the outputs and I'm like, that's, yeah, you can, you can beat this pretty easily with what we already have today. Um, so yeah, I mean. What was your background in computer vision before that? Had you done anything with computer vision or deep learning? Uh, I so the, I was I was working at an AI startup. Um, I guess it's public. I was working at Vicarious, uh, and yeah, I mean it was relatively new to the stuff. But I, don't know, I guess I'd done computer vision before. Um, my sophomore year science fair project was a robot that could drive around. You type in an object. It was a Googler. It's like the physical instantiation of Google. It would like drive around. You could type in like basketball and go pick up a basketball and bring it to you. Um, it wasn't very, uh, it wasn't very good computer vision, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was, it just, I mean, deep learning just makes really simple intuitive sense. Uh, so you just, you know, gather a data set of images, data set of ground truth and you match the images to the ground truth. Um, so yeah, the idea was I was going to build that, uh, mobile eye replacement for Elon. Awesome. And then, so what happened? Why, why didn't it uh, happen? Like, why, why didn't you stay on, like, work for Tesla? So it's a long time ago now, but um, that was almost five years ago now. Uh, Elon and I had agreed to a contract, uh, which said I was going to get paid out upon completion um, of the when my thing was better than, than mobilized by a set of provable metrics, uh, I was going to get paid $12 million if I finished it tomorrow, and then I lose a million dollars for every month I don't finish it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, my, my, favorite, my favorite phrase of, of Elon's was uh, incentive, uh, uh, incentives aligned. Um, so I, I like that. I like that. I thought it was a good deal. Uh, so we went back and forth for, I don't know, weeks with, with, uh, with a lawyer working on the details of that contract. Um, and then, yeah, Elon calls me on my birthday. Uh, and he's like, look, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's not going to be a contract, but I want you to build it and I'll still pay you for it. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, so, you know, we're not going to have completion criteria. One of the completion criteria is going to be whether I like it or not. 
I'm like, well, that's no, but that's not a contract anymore, right? You can't have a contract to be gated on your subjective feelings about what the thing is, right? Because then I'm, I'm working and, you know, I've been a contractor for a long time. That's that's a quick way to be like, well, actually, we just want these three more little features, right? So, so I was like, no. Um, and yeah, by this point, I'm like, by this point, I'd had actually a lot of progress made on the, on the mobile eye replacement. Hmm. Um, that's interesting. And you yeah, weren't, you weren't even like, under contract at that point, is that right? So you were just doing no. it just, just for fun because yeah, as research and preparation and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I had, I had it rigged up in my car. I was matching, like, the, I was ground truthing it using the CAN bus, and I was matching the CAN bus to, the, uh, to the, the, the images, and you could know where the car actually went, and I was predicting where the car should go. And you now I could start to say, okay, now I'm predicting you should turn. Now I'm predicting you should go straight. Just predicted steering angle from images. I sent an email to Elon saying, "Look, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this. Uh, if you want to invest, you can invest the car, the prototype car that I was gonna work on." He's like, "Nah, nah, nah, nah." So I went out and bought an Acura. <laughs> that, that was the story. <laughs> Got attention from from Ashley Vance. You know, wanted to, wanted to get back at Elon. So, so it was just that criteria, the issue, then not having a set firm set of like, this is what it depends on. Well, yeah, okay, because it. it's not a contract at that yeah, point, yeah. right? Like a contract needs to be a, a a neutral third party needs to determine whether the contract is completed or not. You can't have one of the parties say the contract will be completed because I'd say it'll be completed right away, and Elon will be like, "Well, you know, actually, I wanted to do full self driving, and uh, you know, I want to nap in the back seat, and I want it to be that good." And I'm like, "That's that's you know." So it was basically like a zero dollar contract if you think about it. It's like kind of giving you an impossible task. Well, beating Mobileye was a very possible task. The Mobileye yeah, IQ3 true. was was quite bad, and part of the reason it's so bad is because the chip is so low power. I believe it's a it's like a it's like twenty eight or forty five nanometers, and it draws like a watt or two. So I mean, I could just you know I could throw ten x more compute at this. Who cares? Also, wasn't the thing with Mobileye that they kind of like fabbed the neural net into the chip or something like that? So it wasn't that flexible. Yeah, it's unclear if IQ3 even really was a neural net. I think it had some neural net capabilities. It does have some processing capabilities, but yeah, there was a lot of hard-coded computer vision. Uh, I mean, Mobileye, Mobileye is less of a scam now. Mobileye was more of a scam back then. Mobileye was more like, well, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to make these chips that like do like the minimum requirement to meet these, uh, these safety features. All right. And then we're going to work with regulators to mandate the safety features and then everyone's going to have to buy Mobileye. Huh. It's, it's business, right? <laughs> they've, they've, they've changed. They've, they've come around. So did that work that you were initially doing for what you thought would be Elon's contract kind of get you thinking, hey, I could, I could do this with, with Kama and kind of birth that company? Well, I mean, it was Kama, right? There was no... The Kama originally was an, uh, a, a single-purpose LLC for the contract. We uh, dissolved it and created the C-Corp version and... Uh, yeah, and I was like, you know what, I'll get, I'll get investment. Basically, Kama was kind of a spin-off of this original idea that computer vision can drive a car by itself. Yeah. You were working at Google, though, right before that, right? Um, I was an intern on Project Zero. <laughs> yeah, ah. I was an intern on Project so, Zero. I actually, I went back yeah. to school. R- right before that, I was at, I was at Vicarious, an uh, AI startup in uh, East Bay. Yeah, this is really interesting. For those people who don't know about Kama, because there's probably some out there listening to the podcast, the idea was basically, you know, it's not like autopilot or any of these other self-driving car systems where, you know, you take a robo-taxi ride. George said, you know, let's build something that we can just add into any car. You know, any new Toyota Corolla, you can go install this Kama AI device, you can install OpenPilot, and you'll be able to get autopilot-like functionality on that car. Well, that's what it is today, but that's not how it started out. How did it start out? Well, I mean, I needed a car to <laughs> test it. Uh, you so did an Acura, I, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I bought an Acura ILX. I, was, I went around to the dealerships, and I was like, can you show me the car turning the wheel and hitting the brakes, right? Because I need a car. I'm not, I'm not rigging up motors to the wheel. Or, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know much about it back then, but once I saw that it could turn the wheel, I'm like, okay, there's some software doing that, right? Once I saw that it could hit the brakes, I'm like, this is software. I just need to figure out how to, how to, how to intercept the, uh, the, the, the calls. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild what it became that we can now support, uh, like, I think it's like 80 different cars now. 
um, yeah, we support everything, right? We just we just reverse engineered all the uh, abstraction layers for all the cars, and then we have this like vehicle abstraction layer in OpenPilot, which uh, makes all the cars appear the same to the OpenPilot software. So the vehicle, the manufacturers aren't actually um, helping you; you're just doing it on your own. Yeah, the manufacturers. No, I, 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 I haven't spoken with a single uh, manufacturer. Out. But the regulators came and slapped you, right? They said no, right? Well, not really. So, I mean, yeah. that story was played up by the media and we let it get mm-hmm. played up. So you run into this problem where, you know, one of the big problems in startups is you want to separate the people who believe in the idea from the people who, like, are trying to get on board a hype train. Mm-hmm. And one way to do that is, you know, a big fuck you to regulators is a great way to just lose all the hype train people, right? Like, you know, they, 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 they disappeared overnight. The, the, the dick riders disappeared overnight. Um, and, oh, you're a combo. They're out of business. They're out of business. Look, we've been around five years. We're a profitable company. We support 80 cars. We have thousands of daily active users. Like, yeah, so you can actually go to Combo's website right now and get an open pilot device and just the, install the, the software on it. You can mm-hmm. purchase hardware, which you comes with no software. Yeah, no software. You can install whatever so, you'd like so, on your device. Um, which is I noticed that Tesla isn't officially supported, but I'd love to see like how it compares. So can can it actually work with a Tesla? Just curious. Oh, yeah. There's, I think, about 120 Tesla users. So OpenPilot's open source. There's forks. Uh, there's there's thousands of forks of the software. Only like 10 really get use. But uh, one of the forks supports supports Teslas. Uh, yeah, and there's a... There's a Decent-sized community of people who are getting it to work on pre-AP1 Model S's. Exactly, because I had a pre-autopilot uh, Model S, a 2013 Model S, and it would have been great. You know, someone's going to have that car, and they can actually go out and get your system and add it to it and then get autopilot. And because the lane keeping is, is the most important thing. There's some annoyances about it. There's some annoyances about it. So the the EPS is the same. So the, the steering works the same. Uh, it's using the same steering as uh, in the new Model S's, but the brake is different. Uh, so the pre-AP1 Model S's did not have adaptive cruise control. They actually didn't have a way to hit the brakes. Uh, they only had traction control brakes, and you could do regen. Um, but, you know, regen is limited if your battery's full. Um, it works. It's not the best supported car. There was a video that came out uh, about three months ago comparing the Toyota Corolla to the... Uh, Model 3 on autopilot. Yeah, yeah, someone did that. I saw that. There's pros and cons. Uh, I wouldn't say one is strictly better than the other. Uh, it depends on what you want to use it for and like how you feel the system should be. I want to go on the racetrack with it. <laughs> Just kidding. But... We'll, we'll engage. Autopilot probably won't engage. Yeah, yeah. some of the features of autopilot do like some of the safety features, but when you're on the track, actually they have track mode, which is a whole other thing, which is... Uh, you know, another discussion, but that's that's kind of exciting to me when the car can actually do it the ultimate lap for you. You know, well, I mean, it'll do a really shitty lap, but I think right open now, pilot, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think Open Pilot will. Uh, I mean, Open Pilot will engage anywhere. Um, autopilot, you know, sometimes you tap and it says Autopilot not available. Um, we engage and we try our best no matter where we are. So you can engage it on a track. Will it get around the track? Yeah, probably at twenty five miles an hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some of the stuff we shipped last year, too, like it doesn't rely on really lane markers anymore. Mm. It kind of uses them, but it can drive without them too, as well. So what's your take on kind of the general state of the self-driving car market right now? Like, you know, we've seen players like, you know, Waymo and Cruise and others like that for 10 years. How do you see this technology actually coming into the marketplace and being used by people? So Zooks is looking for a buyer at investment cost. Uh, Cruise, Cruise yesterday just announced layoffs. Now, let's talk about that. I mean, you, you have layoffs. Why? Because you lost so much revenue because of coronavirus? Uh, oh, wait, you didn't make revenue. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know what? I, it, it does kind of seem like uh, this whole thing with the virus is kind of a, a smokescreen for people to kind of offload a lot of their problems. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, blame the virus. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of things are getting blamed on it. I mean, um, you know, it, a lot of pre-revenue companies, you know, are laying off people. And it's like, okay, uh, this didn't really impact you at all. So 
where, you know, it was probably something they were about to do anyway before. And it's no secret that these projects haven't exactly been going as well as expected. They just keep pushing the date out and out and out. Yeah. It's standard, uh, it's standard uh, cult leader stuff, you know? When the world didn't end last year, oh, but don't worry, we got new stuff. The world's like, check out my cruise origin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, that was kind of crazy. They, you know, they showed this concept, but it just seems so far ahead of where the technology actually is. I mean, it seems like no one's designing realistic products. It's not even, it's not even far ahead. The cruise origin was so... It's so sad. <laughs> do, do, does anybody want that? Has anybody sat in a Model 3, like their own Model 3, and been like, you know what I really want? A small golf cart where we face each other. Yeah. <laughs> hey, nobody wants this. Kyle, though, do you ride the bus? Real question. How do you feel about the bus? <laughs> well, at least on the bus, you don't have to face each other. I, it, yeah. it's managed, they managed Some to buses. make something worse than a bus. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do they think? Do they think... Do, do these people think self-driving cars are immune from, like, acceleration? Sitting backwards and stuff is uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, I would be kind of scared of uh, sitting backwards in some, you know, programmer's fucking self-driving car that, you know, I don't know if it's going to work or not, right? Like, you can't even see in front of you. <laughs> the thing about Cruise is even if, like... Like, the car is so stupid, even if the software works, which it doesn't, <laughs> but it's still so stupid. <laughs> right? You know what? Why don't you put, you ever see the Mechanical Turk? They should put just a lying down human at the bottom of the car to drive it, you know? <laughs> Prototype yeah, that might actually work. Origins. Yeah. Small, we're looking for uh, people who can fit in this small compartment. Um, yeah. All right. All right. No, no more. I'm done ripping on cruise. But, you know, it's kind of like, even if they figured out autonomy, would people use this? Would they give up their cars? Is this how people want to get around all the time? That's how the Silicon Valley elite <laughs> imagine the pleb should be transported. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to wonder if they would really want to use that themselves. You know, it's it all seems kind of just like this fantasy world is kind of detached from reality. Yeah, I mean, but they, I mean, in, in a sort of way, they have to. And, like, I kind of do feel bad for these people. Like, you know, what do you do if you've raised billions of dollars and really have kind of nothing to show for it? You have to promise stuff that's better and better and better. And, like, and then eventually, the, 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 you know, the house of cards collapses. But Well, the problem is they have a strategy where they essentially need to achieve level five before they generate their first dollar of revenue. Yeah, there's no incremental work, but that's that's different to what you're doing because you're actually you've got cars on the road, people are using it, and getting data back. I mean, you know, what are your thoughts on the you know what's your vision for the company going forward for Comma? I mean, what do you want to achieve? We have the second largest network right now of uh, of like autonomous vehicles. Tesla has the largest, obviously, um, by 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 a huge margin. Um, but like eh, people think like oh well, Waymo has a lot of cars. Comma has more. Kama has way more than, than, than Cruz and Zooks. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're number two right now in terms of, in terms of that. And like, there's a question of kind of how many cars you're going to need in order to get to level five, like how much data collection you're going to need. Uh, we estimate that it's between 10 and 100,000. Just like to be able to kind of almost train the models in, in, in real time and to get like the statistical, to, to, to be able to stay with statistical significance, your safety factor over a human. So yeah, I mean, you know, Tesla has already way more than enough. Uh, they're not limited by that. We can talk about what they are limited by later. But um, I think that 10,000 number applies to everybody. So can you really imagine one of these Waymos scaling up to 10,000 cars with zero revenue? Yeah, <laughs> where, where each car costs, what, 400 plus thousand dollars or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, costs like, it costs like a million per car over like the lifespan of the car. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, someone's got $10 billion to blow on that stuff. But What's your take on what happened with... Uh... Anthony Lewandowski and Uber, you know, they just sued him. Like, I think he's going bankrupt now and maybe going to jail. Yeah, so I read an article once about this guy who stole uh, a piece of trading software from Bear Stearns. And um, I think it was Bear Stearns. And, and they caught him. They deleted the software. There was no harm to anybody. And he got eight years in jail. Uh, oh, I think it was Goldman Sachs. Yes, it was Goldman <laughs> Sachs. Yes. Um 
And that just shows you, I mean, you know, if you believe that all prosecutions are political, well, that's a Julian Assange quote. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what happened there. Google got back at Mr. Lewandowski for leaving them. Yeah, I mean, like, you see their videos, and it's just kind of this happy-go-lucky, like, Waymo, like, everyone's going to get around in a Waymo, <laughs> and it's just like this cheesy marketing stuff, and everyone kind of considers them the, the leader in self-driving, and it's just kind of amazing to me that it's like, okay, nobody uh, is questioning the fact that this is taking 10 years, and they're saying it's not going to be done anytime soon. Well, so it's interesting to say, like, like uh, Waymo's the leader in the Special Olympics for self-driving cars. <laughs> like, like you know, or here, here's the quote. Here was the quote that I gave on on Twitter, right? Uh, if Tesla's, uh, if the race is from from uh, California to New York, LA to LA to, to New York City, uh, Tesla is driving in a, in a in a Model S. They just drove by St. Louis. Uh, we're sitting at LAX waiting while our, our our plane's delayed. But you know, once the machine learning takes off like AlphaGo, we'll be good. And Waymo's the furthest along. Their cruise ship just docked in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then what about the tech? Because I mean, they're they're uh, mostly lidar right now. I mean, it's you know they got the tech disadvantage, and well, in my opinion, and the the data disadvantage. It's unclear what that even means that they are lidar, right? Like those companies are using lidar for localization, most more more than anything else. They can do perception with the other stuff. It's localization that's hard to do. Doing doing precise localization like centimeter accurate with cameras is. Now it's becoming possible, but it was not possible a couple of years ago. Um, and But that whole approach is so wrong, I think. I think this whole approach where you are tracking your car down to the centimeter, and if, like, a lane moves, well, that's not the map, sorry. That's where we go. It's, <laughs> We're screwed. It's a line fall. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a line-following robot. Mm -hmm. um, and and it must be this... costly to pre-map everything, too. Sure. And, like, you know what? You can do the math. And, like, you know, people are like, oh, well, the unit economics, the unit economics, don't worry, it works out. Once we scale it up to 100 million cars and 50% of people are riding with Waymo, the mapping cost becomes negligible. Yeah. Who's going to ride Waymo? That's, that's my question. Who really wants to ride Waymo? <laughs> Mom self-driving minivan. I mean... Look, I mean, if you think of, if you think of, like, like, it is pretty, it's weird, like, like, the way they're, they're marketing is they're marketing it like it's something special. There's two ways in which a ride sharing app can compete, in my mind. You can compete on cost, and you can compete on speed. So, if right. you make something that's cheaper than Uber, why do I, do I care if I get an Uber or a Lyft? No. Which one's cheaper, and which one's gonna get here first? Exactly. Right? And then with the Waymo, you also have to, okay, I assume that it's a wash. Do Lyft drivers or Uber drivers drive faster? I don't know. But, you know, those self-driving cars drive mad slow. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, yield to everybody in this stop sign. That's what I want my Uber driver to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a 10-minute drive and, you know, it took 40 minutes to get there because the car had to keep detouring. <laughs> Yep. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think it'll be that. But, like, like fundamentally, they talk about it like it's not a new experience. Whereas with things like like, like autopilot and open pilot, they're actually new experiences for people. Um, they're experiences that people who have an experience don't exactly understand what it is or why they want it. But then once people use it, they're like, uh, so our, our cohort analysis, our retention rate, more than 50% of people who purchased a comma product are daily active users. It's pretty good. Mm. Wow. The only thing that really beats us on those numbers is mobile phones. Mm. I, don't, I think we even beat laptops. Wow. Um, when it comes to like consumer electronics, you know, people don't use their laptop every day. Maybe, you know, maybe some people do, but like how many laptops sit around? You know what VR is? You know, you know how many times the average VR headset is used, the median? <laughs> once wow. a year, maybe. It's once. <laughs> it's once. The average VR headset is bought and used once. That's crazy. Yeah, it sounds like mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mine I mean, too. that's what they all are, right? And that's like the problem with some of these new, and not to rip on VR, I love VR. Um, but this, this cohort analysis idea of like, you know, you're giving people something new. Um, what's the cohort analysis for AirPods? He's in the eye. It's a great product. Um, so it seems like you're kind of skeptical of Silicon Valley. Like, you know, Silicon Valley, of course, famous for, you know, microchips, phones, computers, but it kind of seems like 
you know, some of these products that have been hyped are just hype. You know, these next big things. Wait, microchips, which are now made by TSMC, Samsung, and kind of Intel up in Portland, though, you know, that's, that's, that's faltering. Uh, and going at Global Foundries in Taiwan, too. Wait, that doesn't look like Silicon Valley. No, actually, none of those places are Silicon Valley. Yeah, where's the silicon? Well, yeah, I mean, and then, like, phones, which are made by, like, well, okay, Apple. But Apple's not Silicon Valley. Apple's, Apple is a 50-year-old company. Right? Like, what has come out of Silicon Valley in the last 10 years? Social networking. What else? Well, name something, like, like, what else? And these, like, weird social apps. Okay, you have things like Uber. But, like, that's not a, that's not a, that's a platform. Airbnb. These things are not technology. I don't know why anyone thinks they are. Who's getting duped here? So the platform valley? <laughs> yeah, it's platform valley. It's platform valley, and and then they're making these 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 things are literally not technology. Well, some would say you know that it's just kind of VC money subsidizing businesses with bad unit economics. That you know Uber's a cash burning business. You know Eats is losing money. Grubhub's losing money. They combine them, and they're just kind of using VC money to deliver food to people. Because they're promising one day when everybody, when nobody even thinks of eating in any way besides Uber Eats, will finally be profitable. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm not saying, you know, look, I like Uber, right? I'm not saying, like, like Uber has definitely added value to my life, but it isn't really technology, right? It's, you, you can imagine Uber being done in the 80s with a switchboard. What, what has actually made Uber possible today? The mobile phones are pretty nice. Uh, yeah, I mean, you need a way for people to actually call the Ubers and, uh, you know, you need a way to uh, pay all these people and match make. And... But yeah, I mean, again, not technology. So you think autonomy could be that technology that really causes a shift? Well, autonomy is technology, right? Tesla is technology. SpaceX is technology. These are technology companies. Right? Google and Facebook are not technology companies. Uber is not a technology company. Airbnb is definitely not a technology company. You know what was really not a technology company? WeWork. WeWork. <laughs> WeWork was a shitty office real estate company. They're like, oh, it's technology. And, you know, but I hope everybody learned their lesson. And I hope everybody can apply the WeWork lesson to all the rest of the stuff, too. Well, the pandemic shook it up for sure. Everyone's working from home now. <laughs> Yeah, so switching gears, I'm just curious, uh, coming back to the Tesla stuff and the, uh, the, have you actually tried out the new software, the, the new stoplight? I have not tried out stoplights yet. I rented a car, uh, I rented a Model 3 for a week and a half for a road trip, and I did 1,000 miles on autopilot. Um, and it's, uh, it's very similar to Pot. It's very similar. Uh, some things I think it does better. Uh, some things I think it does worse. Right. Um, when I realized I didn't have to touch the wheel to reset the timer, I oh, could just the move bars? the volume knob. Yeah, yeah. It got way better. Exactly. It got way better. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. a really good, <laughs> good feature. Yeah, I'll show you the traffic control thing if you want. Oh, yeah. I've, cer I've certainly watched the videos. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. So your system has a driver monitoring as well. So you're looking mm -hmm. to make sure the driver's paying attention. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Because I know Tesla doesn't have that. Well, it may have that in the future with the Model 3s because we have the selfie cam. But, uh, no, no. I'll tell you why Tesla doesn't have it. It's sad too. Okay. Mm. Well, the problem with what's the problem with the selfie cam? Why can't you use it for driver monitoring? You tell us. Yeah. <laughs> well, they can't see at night. So our original, our Eon, the last generation Comma device, had the same problem. We couldn't do driver monitoring at night. So if you can't rule out driver monitoring completely, um. You, you know, like, do you want to roll it out at all? Right. And it must be a huge task, too. Like, I feel like driver monitoring is, you know, almost as complex of a computer vision problem as, you know, say, lane keeping or something like oh, that. Oh, no, not even, not, not even You close. don't think so? Oh, it's no. so easy. Driver monitoring is so easy. We, we, we built our prototype in like a week, and the prototype was like good enough that we demoed it to press the next week. See, so, so if you're George Hotz, it's, it's easy. <laughs> no, but it's it's easy for everyone. It's, oh, yeah. it's, it's easy for everyone. We, we, like, my, my point is it's easy because like all we did, we downloaded this open source face detector called PRNet. 
Um, we've moved past this a lot, but then we like trained a model to kind of we we ran PR on our data, and then we trained a model on top of that, and it was it was quick and easy, and like you know what, no startups have good lane keeping except for like us really, um, and no, uh, there's ten startups that have totally acceptable driver monitoring solutions. It's much easier. Um, yeah, now. To, to get that last bit, our driver monitoring has come a long way. We now have a full-time engineer on it. Um, and he, he's great. He's like, he shows me the metrics and like, we're, we're just, just pushing it to the point that, you know, it's really hard to get caught. Uh, it's really hard to, to, to not pay attention and not get caught. And it's also, you know, if you are paying attention, it's good. So reading curbs with the camera with the, is really hard for the Tesla, but you're, the con, you're, you're not having that issue then. We don't try to do things like that. Um, mm -hmm. so, I'll preface this by saying I think Tesla is two years ahead of us in hardware, um, four years ahead of us in fleet size, uh, but I think we're ahead on machine learning. I, I think that that because Tesla has resources, what they've done is Tesla's whole thing is based around like a big segment. They, they have a, a net which is labeling stuff in the image, labeling curbs, labeling lanes, labeling cars, and you've seen it. You've seen this. You've seen mm -hmm. these visualizations right. online. Um, so we don't really do that. We look at a picture and we ask the question, given this picture, where would a human drive the car? Okay. So we don't need to explicitly detect a curb in order to know not to drive into that curb. We just look at the picture and say, where would a human drive? And the answer is not into the curb. As long as they're not drunk or something, then you're, you're okay. <laughs> yeah. And most humans aren't. Most humans, most humans are good drivers. Sure. And that's one of the reasons it works. I mean, humans actually like... You know, people are always like, oh, machines, they're going to be so much better than humans. They're not even close to humans. Humans are incredibly good drivers. So do you feel it's uh, it's easy enough to get the training data you need to train your models? Yeah, yeah, I got, I got, I got 30,000 miles coming in a day. 50,000 now. Wow, that's crazy. That's pretty good. Yeah, amazing. So, so if you don't, uh, so you guys don't do 3D labeling or you do something else, but how, how's, what's your approach that, how's it different? To Tesla. We don't do labeling. So you're just basically depending on the driver completely. So it's like self-supervised or something? Yeah. So we do we do we do small amounts of labeling for a few things. In fact, actually we have a project, we have an open source project now, uh comma ten K, where users are, are giving us labels. But we only have five categories. Road, lane, undrivable, movable. I feel like there's one more. Oh yeah, my car. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the pick the, the you can see like hood and stuff. Um, but actually, those are more used for understanding the motion of the scene. Um, lanes are the only semantic category we have, and it's because they're good for maps. But all the other categories have to do more with semantics. right? Road, you can assume, is all in a plane. I have less to do with semantics. Road, you can assume, is all in a plane. Uh, uh, movable stuff moves in a way different from the ego motion of the vehicle. My car stuff never moves. So it's not about semantically labeling stuff because that becomes really hard. You know, some of these data sets, it's like they label cars and trucks a different color. Well, what do you label an F-150? What do you label an F-250? What if it's pulling a trailer, right? Where's the line? It's nowhere. Right. Yeah, because uh, there's so many edge cases. It seems like Tesla, they keep improving in their visualization. Like you can see that this is now a pedestrian walking you know, across the road before it was just phase front on and then what they were sh like, you know, shifting across like that. So the latest software update. But uh, I mean, you're saying that that's not as important as just understanding those few basic things. Yeah, that's I mean, it makes for nice visualizations, but I actually think this is one of the ways one of the, the, the wrong directions Tesla's going in. You're going to get and like Waymo does this, too. Um, we joke at Kama about Waymo's cone guy. Right? And he like gave like a long presentation about the taxonomy of cones, all the different cones, what they mean, what their placements might mean. And we joke like as a self-driving car company, once you've hired a cone guy, you've failed. Um, You're so telling we me they have a guy whose job is just cones? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, his whole presentation was about cones. So we joke about <laughs> it, right? <laughs> like, like, when I was driving the, uh, when I did the road trip, when I was driving the car on autopilot, that was, it was detecting the cones. So the cones show up in the Tesla visualizer and we're like, I mean, he's not full time yet, but Tesla's on the cone guy trajectory. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, they, they had this video where the, this woman dressed up as a cone and. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, uh, that was pretty hilarious. But yeah, I mean, I think the visualization is important to the human to know that the computer's actually doing something. I mean, that's, that's really like it, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I trust this computer that it's going to 
you know, treat me right and do the right thing safely and all that stuff. It's a cool ad for the Tesla cars. If we had an extra, if we had, we have a lot of stuff that's just unvisualized because I don't have a good uh, UI person. Uh, if someone out there is looking for a job and wants to come write our sick visualizations, we could uh, totally do that too. So let's talk about the hardware a little bit. Um, so in terms of like inference on these models you've trained, do you have some kind of GPU in the hardware or how exactly are you doing that? So we have a Snapdragon 821 uh, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the comment too. Um, and the Snapdragon 821 has uh, 500 gigaflops uh, on the GPU. So we have 500 gigaflops of compute. 500 gigaflops can run a lot. Um, our newest model is an efficient net B2. Um, so efficient net is like the latest, uh, the latest paper and efficient FB2 is like better than a ResNet 50. Tesla's based on ResNet 50. Um, so you can run decent size models in this, as long as you're not obsessed with like running it on eight cameras, right? If you're trying to run it on eight cameras, full resolution. Yeah, of course we can't do that, but you don't need to. If you're trying to track every car in the scene, we can't do that, but you don't need to because you're not doing that as a human. If you look at these visualizations, like look at Zooks's, where they're tracking like 30 different cars and 1,700 pedestrians in Market Street, humans don't do this. Humans look and say like, you know, there's a bunch of people over there. I don't want to drive my car into them. Oh, there's like a car in front of me. Oh, that car is like coming to cut me off, right? You're paying attention to like two cars and like two people. Right. Yeah. Kind of scanning for danger, looking if someone's going to walk yeah. into the street or anticipating. It's a... It's about knowing which ones. Though. Yes. It's about, exactly. you can't just pick randomly. No. Um, so being able to know which ones and being able to have your machine learning software pick that is, is super important. So how would, yeah, I'm not familiar exactly with that Snapdragon processor you mentioned. Is it kind of like, how would you compare it to say, you know, the latest Samsung phone or something like that in terms of processing power? Or, or even like the latest NVIDIA, you know, they came out with a new chip as well. Oh, God, don't get me started. Oh, NVIDIA is another company that I could rip on a lot. But uh, no, to, 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 compare it to, to compare it to a modern uh, smartphone, so it's the Snapdragon 820 was a 2016 era smartphone processor. So that's pretty amazing. You're basically driving a car with a smartphone. Oh, it is a smartphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. It's actually a phone motherboard. It's a phone motherboard in the device. So do, do you find it, you know, challenging in terms of the resource constraints on that uh, on that system or is it actually pretty easy? So when you run a neural network on a GPU, the CPU is like queuing up all these commands and that's doing tons of work in the GPU driver. So that was using half of a core. So we have a four core processor uh, to run the whole thing on and uh, it was using 50% of a core. Um, but... You know, whenever we run into resource constraints, we think, how can we be more clever? The resource constraints kind of help us out. Like, I don't feel massively constrained in any kind of way. We're running an efficient net B2 at 20 FPS. So with the model, that's very good. Um, and then with, like, all the CPU, I mean, it's written in Python, too. A lot of OpenPilot wow. is actually Python. Wow. So, like, you know, uh, car, the, the, the car control problem is low speed. People think, like, oh, it's all got to be, like, real time and perfect doesn't really matter. Humans, like, you always have at least 50 milliseconds to react to everything in driving. Human react times 250, right? Like, um, so, yeah, are we resource constrained? Somewhat, but not that, not as much as you'd think. So why did you choose not to run on, say, an NVIDIA Jetson or something like that? So, you know what? I'm going to get something. I'm going to get something. I'll be right back. This is one of the saddest things in the company's history. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I've never shown this to anyone yet. <laughs> Great. This here is a comma six. Ooh. Nice. It has six cameras. I like the little logo cameras. on the board. Wow. Yeah, right? I love it. Um, and in here is an NVIDIA Jetson TX2. Mm. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Yep. There was, there was a time... By you the made way, it smaller. This, 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 this prototype is from 20 this is from 2018 mm. so this is this is two years old now mm. um basically what happened is nvidia uh well the first people we spoke to from nvidia were very nice the first people we spoke to from nvidia were like yeah we can sell you tx2 chips 80 bucks a chip the documentation for the TX2 chip is much better than the documentation for the Qualcomm chip. It's all available online. So we're like, great, we're going to design it around this NVIDIA chip. They're going to love us. 
Well, the guy who was in charge of NVIDIA's autonomy division got fired. Oh. <laughs> and they put a new person in, job, in charge. Oh, and no. this new person is a complete moron. <laughs> like, Damn it. that chip and, and, and NVIDIA's strategy around this for the last uh, two years has been completely nonsensical. So what actually happened when we met with the new business development people from NVIDIA to talk to them about buying chips, they looked at me, they're like, we're not going to sell you chips. You can buy modules. Oh, These modules gosh. are $400. Yep. What? I, 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 wasted, I wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars designing this thing. Um, it's, it's, it's sad. It's sad. And they're like, we're just not going to sell you chips. You can't do anything. You can't get the chips anywhere else. Um, when you, at least Qualcomm has multiple different module manufacturers. Qualcomm was honest with us too. We, we approached Qualcomm to buy chips and Qualcomm's like, we'll sell you chips. So you got to buy a hundred thousand. I'm like, thank you for being honest with mm-hmm. me. Right. NVIDIA, you know, they, they butter you up. They send over the guys. And this is why I really don't trust business development people. And then I'm like, okay, I actually want to place an order for 2,000 chips. They're like, get out of here. Not cool. Um, but then what NVIDIA comes out with next is the Xavier. The Xavier costs $1,100 for the module. Yikes. The cost to automakers, 500 That's not right. What? What's up with that? Who do they think they're selling to? Automakers will pay 50 bucks. They just came out with another one. They came out with an even more ridiculous one announced two days ago. That's again, these like, these massive chips that cost $250 to fabricate. There is no, you can do incredible level two. So this is a comma two. This is, this is, this is our, our flagship product. This is a comma two. It has a Snapdragon 820 in it. You can do incredible level two autonomy on a Snapdragon 820. Snapdragon 820 now is a $50 chip. Yeah. With the five hundred dollar chip, you're not going to get a robo taxi because robo taxis aren't real. No, you're yet. not even going to get better level two. Everything that makes level two better is software bugs in OpenPilot. We're not even really constrained much by this hardware. This single camera, people are like, "Oh, you have one forward facing camera." We're only using twelve percent of the box, and we're only using twelve percent of the box not because of resource limitations. Uh, we're using twelve percent of the pixels, not because of resource limitations, but because of our training architecture. You know, we have to simulate and we need more box. We're fixing this, but um, I, I just, I, you know, I, I, I can't believe NVIDIA rent-seeking on the whole, uh, on the whole. What happened with NVIDIA? I mean, they were originally powering, you know, Tesla and Autopilot. And I know. People were, people were thinking, oh, you know, mm-hmm. th- these guys are going to be a big player in autonomy. They have the GPUs. And it seems like their whole kind of autonomy strategy they- really went off the rails. I'll say this, and I won't go into details on it, but they had a similar business development experience that we did. Hmm. Hmm. NVIDIA basically said, screw you to Tesla. Yeah. Like, that was so stupid. And this is another, like, (laughs) why do you think, why do you think Tesla built that chip? Right? I mean, that's, 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 that's typical. Elon got mad and said, fuck them, we're going to build our own chip. (laughs) And it's going to be way better than theirs. (laughs) Right? Yeah. There was no reason for this. There's no reason Tesla should be building a chip unless NVIDIA tried to rent seek to the moon, which, you know, it's they, they've prohibited uh, use of consumer GPUs and data center by the, the EULA because they wanted everyone who runs a data center to buy their $10,000 scam GPUs instead of the $1,000. They, 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 they just, NVIDIA has no, they're just like, how can we put money in our pocket right now? Why should we build a $50 chip? We can make our $500 chip. Yeah, I think they got burned really bad by the whole kind of Bitcoin bubble. You know, everyone was buying all these GPUs to mine like Ethereum and then they, you know, ramped up production. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, wait, Ethereum's not worth anything anymore. And now they have all this excess production capacity and no one wants GPUs. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe that's still why the 1080 Ti is the best price per dollar GPU NVIDIA made. You know, it's, 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 it's a four-year-old GPU now. Um, but yeah, the Comma 6 revealed right here a sad <laughs> chapter in Comma's company. And it really got us to consider, like, wait, why do we think we need more than one camera? Why do we think we need more processor? Like, we have the hardware division. You know, go to the hardware division and say, build me the best thing you possibly can. We get this. And then we, like, think and we realize that all the bugs in OpenPilot are actually software. And it has come such a long way in the last three years from the software. 
So it seems like nobody is really considering like cost or unit economics or scalability at all besides Kama and Tesla. Everyone else is just kind of like pie in the sky, like buy all the hardware you need, like no thought of like how we're actually going to get this out and make people use it in a way that's affordable. Well, because you're assuming that the users are their customer, which they're not. The 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 investment banks are their customers. This is a scam. That's right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Build the fanciest thing ever. Make sure to stick your logo everywhere. Make sure to make it look really legitimate. It's 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 you know, it's practically it's practically cargo cult. You know, I think who's going to come out looking great from this is Qualcomm. Hmm. Qualcomm has gone the other way. Qualcomm has gotten better with the business development over the years. Qualcomm has made, there's a great uh, 845 development kit from Thundercom. You can buy them 180 bucks for the whole the whole module, just half the price of NVIDIA for a module that's better. And 845 is better than a TX2. Um, and I think that, yeah, I mean, that's the right chip to put in the car. It's 50 bucks. It's incredibly flexible. It's made already in quantities of millions. Uh, the only there's no mobile phones using Nvidia's chips. The only thing that uses Nvidia's chips is the Nintendo Switch, in any quantity. Um, and the only reason the Nintendo Switch uses it is because Nvidia, the old business development guys, gave it to Nintendo at cost. Uh, They're like, we really nice. want somebody to use our chips. Nvidia, if you want somebody to use your chips, sell your chips on an open market. Don't rent seek. Charge twenty percent over what it costs you to make them, and everyone will use the chips. I hope they do. So do you think anyone's left using them in the autonomy space, NVIDIA? Not really. Like, the car manufacturers aren't. The, the car manufacturers are... I mean, the IQ5 is a decent chip. I mean, Mobile, Mobile has gotten better. Mobileye, Mobileye has gotten, uh, you know, so much better since their original fallout with Tesla. Um, there's some decent chips using... There's some decent... Uh, so, Super Cruise is using Mobileye. It's an IQ3. And there's new IQ4 cars that look good, and the IQ5 looks pretty good. Like, you know, why why would anyone use NVIDIA? Yep, especially if they're not even willing to sell it to you at a reasonable price. Oh, I'm sure I'm sure they'll sell it to Audi uh, in quantities of 10 million for 500 dollars a chip. Yeah, it's not reasonable. So you're back to Snapdragon then? We're full on Qualcomm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, we've moved to San Diego too. Qualcomm's here. Uh, yeah, they're you know, at least with Qualcomm, you know exactly what you're going to get. So, how do you see this all playing out with the autonomy players, like the spatial approach players and the automakers? Maybe in like the next five years, how do you see it playing out with autonomy? I mean, maybe I'm biased, but. <laughs> I think they're gonna have. I think they're gonna have to run on by it. I think they're not gonna have a choice. Uh, now, of course, you know, OpenPilot's open source. Uh, this might have nothing to do with Kama AI. And to be honest, I don't really care. I just want to win self-driving cars. I don't want to rent seek on self-driving cars. Um, as the gap widens between what manufacturers can offer and what OpenPilot can do it becomes more and more, well, so it's the same thing as phones, right? No, no this isn't Tesla. Tesla's going to continue to develop autopilot. I think autopilot's going to stay uh, a year or two ahead of what we're doing. I think we are, we'll have traffic lights and, well, we're a year behind Tesla. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that you're going to see a decoupling of the the automakers are going to have to give up these stupid ambitions of trying to build these things in-house. No, GM, you are not a connected cloud company. You make metal boxes. (laughs) You know? All these companies. They have to stop thinking. Like, 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 they get in some new, like, lunatic CEO who's like, we're going to pivot into technology. Um, Don't do that. Figure out who you can buy the technology from, stick it in the car, and continue to market cars. That's what you've done your whole life. Why are you trying to do something else? It's tough to change the culture, yeah. Well, no, but that's actually, this isn't actually changing the culture. They have to not change their culture. (laughs) What are automakers, right? Automakers don't make any of that stuff. They buy it all from tier ones and from suppliers, and they they do assemble. They stick it all in a metal box, and then they figure out, you know, the Honda Day sales event to to, to get people to buy them. (laughs) 
Yeah, Sandy Monroe was on our podcast saying that, you know, their their dream is just to take all the parts, you know, literally just stamp their brand on it and yeah. be done with it. Everything's just outsourced. Exactly. And, and like, yeah. it's weird that they don't... GM, why are you investing in Cruise? Why are you investing in a company like that? Yeah. It doesn't make so, sense. Figure out who builds it and stamp your brand on it. <laughs> So would you consider, yeah, I mean, it's kind of fun. Like, sorry, uh, Omar, I was just kind of, would you consider like partnering with those guys and then, you know, just it's integrated at build time. What is, what is, what does partnering mean? Just mean that you don't have to sell it after the car is built. You do it while it's being built. Why do I have to partner with them? It's open source software. They can run it. Yeah, I don't need me. Take the car. We, we, I mean, you know, commas, uh, commas, the people who buy uh, these things. I mean, it's a lot of users, but it's also pretty much every car company. Um, I mean, they're doing it, right? It doesn't, they don't need to work with us. You don't need to call me. I'm crazy. Uh, I just pick software, right? <laughs> Take the software and use the software. It's not about shady backroom development deals. It's not about, oh, well, you know, we could all work with you here. You don't need to. Just take it. It already works on your cars. Your Toyota, your Honda, your GM, the software's already written. So then they would just license it from you? I mean, what would the arrangement be? It's MIT license. Yeah. You could just take it. Okay. So you just... Why license it at all? Yeah. So you just want to make... You basically want to make cars better, safer. You know, that's your... I'm just trying to understand your... No, I want to I want to win self-driving cars. You want cars. to win. Okay. Yeah. Well, after Tesla wins. <laughs> Who won, Apple or Android? <laughs> yeah. Is the way you see it playing out kind of like, you know, autopilot kind of gains popularity. People start ex expecting these driver assistance features and safety features. And the other projects may not end up working out. And then it turns to you. The iPhone gains popularity. Every phone manufacturer had their OS 2.0 thing, but the consumers demanded, you know, something good. So they all kind of turned to Android and all the phones have Android, right? You have iOS and, and Android. And I think that's what happens. Cool. So we, we'll see autopilot and open pilot. Yeah, pretty much. How do you see yourself positioned competitively? Like why, why comma rather than using a mobile eye chip in a car that's pre-built? Yeah. So why, why Linux rather than using the Windows operating system? <laughs> Linux is better. Exactly it. I mean, if you want to, you can make the, you can make the, the Apple versus Android and you can make the iOS versus Android analogy. You can also make the Windows Mac Linux analogy, right? So, 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 you know, Tesla's obviously Mac, right? They make an all integrated. It only runs on their hardware vertical. Um, we're Linux. We're free open source software. And then Mobileye is Windows. They're using business development deals to sell on a per unit basis to the, the manufacturers of PCs or cars or whatever, right? It's literally Windows. Um, so, you know, who do you want to be today? Do you want to make Windows, Mac OS, or Linux? <laughs> well, Linux has the most users by far. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking in like the age of autonomy, people could take an old car and then just take the open source software and make it autonomous with comma keeping all those old cars around. Well, Is that kind well, of how you well, see well, it? Well, 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 well. You don't need to, you don't, you can't just take the software and put it on the car. You also need to, of course, buy a nice box from Kama, which, you know, doesn't come with any software. You can run whatever software you'd like on it. And maybe the boxes will continue to get nicer and they'll add more cameras and they'll cost a bit more money and so on and so forth, right? So, you know, fundamentally, Kama is a business. And as the business, we're a consumer electronics company. We, we make, we make consumer electronics, we sell them, comma.ai slash shop. You can put them on your car, right? So it's not like the car, you put the software on it. You need to first upgrade your car, and then you can put the software on it. You upgrade your car by buying a by buying a little comma device, right? And, you know, well, the comma one was canceled. We made a comma two, so you all can guess what's coming next, right? Like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a classic, it's a classic good business model. We sell hardware for more than it costs us to manufacture, and we make money, and the world gets better. So you haven't been thinking about anything like services or, you know, installing for people or anything like that. Your business is just sell the hardware, you install it yourself. It's so easy to install. 
It takes five minutes. Well, there's there's steps. They just have to push the button on the on the device, right? And it downloads. Oh, the the software is so yeah. The software you just you just say custom software and you type in you know the URL of whatever custom software you want to install. So if you know how to go to a web page, you know how to do that. No, but also there's a physical install process in your car too. But it is people people get this and they think they're going to have to like like you don't even need a screwdriver. That's how simple this is. Right, like it's 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 if you can stick a dash cam to your windshield, you can install this. So what's what's the uh, the other challenges? I mean, so right now, what are you guys uh, working on in terms of your your biggest issue? I mean, that you can talk about, like with full self driving or you know some of the some of the software issues that you're having. So last year we shipped end to end lateral control, which is like what I was talking about before with the curbs. Um, we do the steering based on asking the question, where did the human drive the car? And so we look at the picture and say, where did the human drive the car, right? But this doesn't tell you how fast the human went. This only tells you, you know, where the human drove the car, right? Um, so the, the how fast the, the person went is a little bit harder, but we're working on that as well. And then once we have that, well, you're going to get red lights and stop signs for free. You see, you don't actually need, in order to stop at a red light, you don't need to detect the light. Detecting a light's a bad strategy. But realizing that in this scenario, humans come to a stop, that's a better strategy. So your model just looks at the whole image and is somehow able to just see from other cars and the lights and everything that it's time to stop? It's going to be the same way you do it. It just like looks at the image and it's like, oh yeah, I should be stepping on the brakes. You don't have a tiny box in your head that isolates the traffic light and then runs a separate model to say what color the traffic light is or anything like that. Um, so we're working on it. We have beta versions of it. Uh, they kind of work. <laughs> kind of? <laughs> well, they kind of work, yeah. What if you had access to like, you know, Tesla's data? They, they've got a, you know amazing amount of data. What if you, you somehow had... Um... You know, if they, they provided that as a database for you guys. Wouldn't help. Because it's all 3D modeling. Uh, we have... No, so, I'm, so those, are, those are Tesla's labels. Oh, labels. So with respect yeah. to just Tesla's, Tesla's raw mm-hmm. data, we have more data right now than we know what to do with. Uh, we can't... I mean, we can't we can't process all the data that comes in. There's too much of it. Right. Um, so we just already... We already are selecting certain data that we want. Um, so no, more more data would not help us. Okay. Um, more labels? Yeah, what would I do with labels? No, what, what we're doing right now, one of the big things we're pushing on is just like, like the machine learning that we're doing here is it's beyond, it's beyond published state of the art. So there's this thing called imitation learning. Imitation learning is like, how do I learn to play a game by watching a human play a game? Um, and there's problems, uh, this gets real technical, but there's this whole problem called behavioral cloning and we now have stuff which can defeat behavioral cloning. Uh, here's, I, can actually, I can explain something actually very simply. If you ask the car, uh, draw the path that the human drove. Um, that path always starts with the center of your car. Because obviously, right? You know, it's, it's, that's what the ground truth says. But that's not what you want, right? If somehow the human ended up in the left side of the lane, you don't want the path to start at the center of your car. You want the path to be, actually, no, you want to be here. Right? So how do you ground truth that? That's, that's tricky. So could, uh, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, so without any, any label data, you're, you know, how exactly are you getting these you know, models trained? Is it just kind of uh, supervising itself or... How exactly are you doing that without labels? I'm just trying to understand. We have labeled data. It's just not pixel labels. So our labeled data is where the human actually drove the car. Mm. So basically, you're 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 labeling it with the driving data. Yeah, I'm labeling it with how the human the human policy basically. That makes sense. So when people are driving manually, those are your labels, and that trains the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when people yeah. are driving with the system, I mean, we can use that data as well. We just have to, you know, keep in mind that it's with the system. And like, if the system makes a mistake, you have to make sure to say, like, this is actually not what you want to do. How, well, how do yeah. you detect a mistake? Is it like a, an intervention by the driver or? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But can you detect it any other way or is that the only way? 
It's the only way, but that's I mean the, that's the right way to detect it. Accidents are so infrequent that. Uh, Right. Well, I mean, you're mostly looking for a uh, driver uh, or, or pedestrians or people doing crazy shit. I mean, it's just human beings do some unexpected things. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like most of the time, the driver, oh, actually, almost all the time, the driver does the right thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, the driver would, but I just mean other other road users are like... But those, yeah. are, those are fine. That's part of the environment. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, here, here's a fun question we got from Twitter. Like if you you know, wanted to go back and learn something or go back to school or something, what what would you study now, now that you have all, like, where you are in your career? No, I mean, what do you mean? What am I, what am I studying right now? Well, you know, yesterday I learned all about OpenCL and GPU command buffers and, like, that kind of stuff, right? I didn't have to go to, go to school for that. <laughs> yeah, I think that the people, th- like, they look at school as, like, I can put something on my resume so I can get a job, whereas... You know, you're looking at what do I need to get this done? <laughs> yeah, what's what's useful knowledge? Useful knowledge is good. What do you look for in people when you're hiring? Intelligence and motivation. That's pretty much it. Okay, so Elon's not big on advertising. How how do you see advertising? Is it just do you believe that the product itself is going to sell? Of course. Do you put a lot into advertising? No, I don't do advertising at all. Um, so, like... So, if you define advertising as paying for eyeballs, no, I never do that ever. Um, like it's 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 I mean it's 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 gross. It's uh, you know, I mean, it's it's not you know, I, I have a, I have a better opinion of paying for sex than I do uh, paying for uh, paying for advertising, right? Like like if, if your shit's good, you should be able to get it for free. You know what? If you can't, I mean. <laughs> You can pay for it, but, you know, really, they don't love you. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to be loved then? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Who are your open pilot users right now? Are they just kind of hackers, or would you recommend it to kind of just the general public? <sighs> if you think you're ready for it, you're ready for it. <laughs> don't, don't, let, don't, let anything, don't let anything hold just you do back. It. Like... Yeah, can 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 people without much technical background figure out how to use it? Sure. Are you motivated and are you intelligent? Yeah, it doesn't matter if you know things about computers. So I had a weird question. You were looking at COVID and um, reverse engineering. Yeah. The virus. Are you still working on that? No, I've after working on it for like five days and then yeah. I, I was thinking in my life, like, how do I actually want to deal with this? This coronavirus thing is a real thing. Yeah. I'm going to have to deal with it. I'm going to have to come up with policies about whether I go to Zoom birthday parties or not, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're conquering it. <laughs> way too many Zoom birthday parties. Oh, uh, dude. Well, yeah. So it's, it's, the same, it's the same sort of procedure, right? The same procedure that I use for anything else. I applied to coronavirus. Uh, I went through it. All the streams are online. And my end conclusion kind of was, Wow can't believe they shut down the economy for this shit yeah. <laughs> yeah. right um so you talked about like law and politics a little bit i was wondering you know what would you like to see on the regulation side when it comes to you know autonomy and other driver assistance type laws that affect comma how would you like to see that evolve i don't think you need much and i think that the reason you don't need much is because everyone's incentives are aligned Um, You need regulation where incentives are not aligned. Like, for example, you know, I think we should have, uh, I think that that, uh, we should have a lot more tax on fossil fuels because it's a negative externality, right? There's an externality. You you buy that gasoline. It's not just the cost of the gasoline. It's also the cost of the, the, right? And incentives aren't aligned there, right? The incentive of the rest of society is, well, you know, we don't really want you to burn that gasoline and that's why there's a tax. But when it comes to something like self-driving cars, well, you know, crashes don't benefit people. They don't benefit automakers, and they don't benefit companies making autonomy software. There is nobody who wants cars to crash, so you don't really need, you know, I mean, eventually you'll put some best practices regulation into effect once it's like, I mean, this is what's always happened in automotive. The normal process of automotive regulation will work perfectly fine for autonomy. Do you mandate seatbelts? Well, not when seatbelts are a new, unproven technology, but once 50% of cars shipping have seatbelts, and now it's just like the lowest cutting cost manufacturers, okay, now seatbelts are mandated. Airbags went the exact same way. And I think eventually we should do the same thing with with uh, level two autonomy systems, with driver monitoring even too. But... Yeah. 
Yo, sorry. You want to drive a car? So, you got to pay attention. Like, so is your driver so monitoring going to like watch the eyes, the pupils, if they're dilated, if people are high or if they're drinking? <laughs> I'm curious. We've talked about it. Yeah, we, 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 we've we talked about it. And I'd be, I don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to say like someone's drunk based on how their, their pupils are dilated. But right, if right. they're <laughs> driving the car by swerving. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Right. I mean, you know, and all we can do, look. The driver monitoring, this is, and this is a common policy. I'm not trying to monitor you when you're not using the system, right? We don't, the driver monitoring doesn't work when the system's not engaged. You can do whatever you want when the system's not engaged. But if you want to use common software, well, you know, that's the trade-off. You get the autonomy and we watch you, right? We don't really watch you. It's all local to the thing. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, that's kind of the trade-off. If you want this convenience feature, the kind of contract with the device is you have to agree to pay attention. And that's what level two is. So at what point do you see the software actually getting good enough to remove the driver monitoring? Not anytime soon. No, no. And I think, yeah, I mean, every time we hear, oh, yes, autopilot's going to be safer than people by the end of the year. Yeah, well, you know, we were going to drive across the country in 27. Tesla was going to drive across the country. New York to L.A. 2017, no disengagements. Still hasn't happened, right? So um, it's going to be a long time. And why do you think that is? I mean, what, just the, the, the last, you know, 1% or whatever. Of, of the problem, or, or is it bigger than that? Yeah, I, I, yeah, it is kind of a, the last 1% problem. Uh, I mean, it's, it's exactly what people think it is. So right now, uh, comma can go about 100 miles between disengagements. Like on the highway, you'll probably be able to drive 100 miles. Oh, autopilot's pretty similar. Yeah, I mean, okay, so humans go about 100,000 miles between disengagements. We're off by a factor of 1,000. Right. So in a way, that's not even one percent. That's like 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 it's not like we're ninety nine percent done. No, we're actually like point one percent done. We're off by a factor of a thousand. Good thing is it will grow exponentially. But, you know, that exponential is going to take a while because we're we're let's say let's say the number of miles between disengagements doubles every year. Right. So if you want to get to a thousand, well, let's see, that's one or two, four. That's like ten doublings. So it's going to take ten years. Wow. That's a good perspective. I mean, I guess that, you know, the, like, I think what George said is really true. You know, Silicon Valley doesn't work on technology anymore. Um, People don't work on technology. They don't work on actually building new uh, technologies that haven't existed before. It's really just kind of like, you know, building software platforms that kind of, you know, transform these legacy businesses into, you know, kind of tech businesses because it's using software. Um, And there are a few people actually working on these really hard problems like autonomy. But uh, this is something that has the potential to really uh, be transformative to the economy, to the way we live life. And uh, everyone's just kind of expecting these self-driving car companies to finish one day. And I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think the legacy automakers are going to be able to deliver. I think most of these VC-funded robo-taxi companies are not going to end up being successful before they run out of cash. So... I think that leaves the vision-based players like Mobileye, Tesla, and Kama to really try and deliver something incrementally that uh, people can use. And I think this is going to be the decade of autonomy, and it's going to be a decade-long project. So I'm excited to see how that all plays out. I think the key distinction actually isn't even vision versus non-vision. It's whether you've shipped products the, the biggest distinction in my mind is, okay, if you want to add a new car to your network, how much money does this cost you? Well, it costs Waymo like, you know, $400,000. Um, it costs comma uh, negative $1,000 and it costs Tesla like negative $10,000. Um, so you know, that's the big distinction. It costs, Mobileye ne- it costs Mobileye negative 50 bucks, right? There's the companies who would cost negative money to grow and there's the companies who would cost positive money to grow. Right. The faster they burn, the faster they grow, the faster they burn cash, which is why they haven't grown. But with Tesla, with Tesla and Comma, it's completely the opposite. That's 100 percent right. I would say uh, that, and also usability. 
Like how many people are really using the product? It's refreshing to talk to George. I mean, his critical thinking skills and feedback are sharp, as we all know. So it's really, <laughs> I enjoyed it. But um, as you were doing the reverse engineering for the um, the genetic, the genome, did you find that it was very similar to coding software, the way that it was laid out? Because I mean, you're doing it on a computer, but. um, So uh, genomes aren't software. There is no processor which interprets them. They're a lot more like CAD models. So it's 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 like a it's a CAD model. It's a three D model um, of a of a of a protein, right? And you can't exactly read the reading the three D model is pretty hard. And then once you have a three D model, figuring out what that three D model does is super hard as well. Um, so yeah, there's some like big downsides to it. I'm not that bullish on uh, biology. Did you like it though? Was it enjoyable? It's enjoyable until you realize it's hard to take this further. Until you realize that I don't have a simulator, I can't test it in the environment. Like, so when I'm, when I'm like working on something that's code, right? I either have like a simulator or I can test it right on the device, right? And for bio, you don't have a good simulator and testing it right on the device involves pipetting. Yeah. It was fun to watch you like talk about the codons and then the protein and <laughs> you were, yeah, that was interesting. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 fun stuff. I always like learning, but um, you know, no comma bio anytime soon. Cool. Well, I actually have another question too because this is like you know long term big vision thing. But you know, past comma AI, I know you have um, you talked about with Lex Friedman, one of our good friends on Twitter. Uh, but you had an interview with him, and you were talking about like you know your your vision for the future. Uh, has that changed much? Or I mean, you you even talked about maybe a future. A digital girlfriend or something like that, you know? Absolutely. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I think about that, I mean, look, you already have, like, like digital girlfriend, like, digital companion apps. They're, like, big in Japan and stuff. That's not really what I'm talking about. Um, the I think I said this on Lex. I see it more like I, if I want to merge with a machine, what does that merger actually look like? And, I mean, I know some couples who they're practically one person, so... So, I mean, it, you know, this brings up like Neuralink and stuff like that. Would you be willing to try something like that? Be like, you know, one, in one of the early. Oh, no. No? <laughs> oh, not hell no. I'm not, no, 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 no. I'm also not getting on a rocket to Mars <laughs> until there's five star hotels there and there's billions of miles of safety data. <laughs> no transferring your yeah. consciousness no into pig. the super machine. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not one of those. I'm not like a, you know. I don't know if I'm, I'm like risk averse or not. You know, when people are like, oh, that's so, you know, oh, that's so, that's such a risky thing. Like to like say that. I'm like, no, I can say whatever I want. And there's no risk. But, you know, to actually like sit my ass on a rocket. Oh, no. To stick some chip in my brain. No, 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 no. no. I'll wait till a million people already did it. And then you might. <laughs> yeah, and then I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm certainly not opposed to either cool. of those things. Well, you don't see you don't see using commas kind of risky. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, that's because you wrote some um, of that code, right? <laughs> no, it's because I trust our safety model. Okay. Um. So it's not. I don't. So level two, I don't ever trust the comma system to do anything. I would definitely not trust it to like fall asleep or get in the back seat or anything. No, 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 no. <laughs> but do I trust using it the way it's intended? Yeah. And I mean, you know, money. Well, money where my mouth is. I use it every day. Like every day that I drive, I, 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 I use the system. I've used it on road trips. Um, the whole safety model is basically built around like the driver pays attention and they're always guaranteed by the system to have at least one second to react. Um, and then as soon as you step on either pedal, it completely stops doing anything. So like if you trust your own reaction time in one second, you're good. Which I do. <laughs> so, I mean, I trust myself to drive But it doesn't car. disengage if you turn the wheel, right? Yeah, that's no, what I was going to we don't disengage about. on wheel. And I'll tell you yeah. why. Because the, Tesla doesn't disengage on gas, right? You can step on the, you can step mm -hmm. on the gas and autopilot stays engaged, but it will disengage on the wheel. Um, see, this seems weird to me because, like, if the car is applying too much brake, the gas is not the opposite of the brake. Mm. And the brake's not the opposite of the gas. They're completely separate things. But with the wheel, if the car's applying too much torque to the right, you can just apply torque to the left. And torque to the left is actually the opposite of torque to the right. Right. So do you use that to label the data, um, uh, train the system? Well, we use corrections to train the system. Yeah, of course. Mm. Disengagements, corrections, they're great sources of training data. That makes sense. Right. So, so I know that you had described 
you 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 feel like it's not that optimal to use the disengagement on steering. But typically, when you disengage, it's not because uh, you just want to do something. It's it's because it might the system might not be doing the right thing. So you're correcting the course, right? Uh, but and I mean, there have been cases where people are like, going, oh, I want to take over now. It's going straight. And you, you're like, oh, the simplest thing is just to, you know, disengage. And then you kind of wobble the wheel, which isn't isn't desirable. So maybe that's what you were talking Wait. about, right? Oh, we, what do you mean we, we wobble the wheel? Oh, when the you With the Tesla. Like if, you, if you're going straight oh, and you're trying to disengage, yeah, no, the, then the, it's the, not desirable. The dis, but, but then you wouldn't the dis, do that. You wouldn't. Yeah. Have, you, have you driven a car with, with open pilot? I actually want to do this. Yeah, it, me too. Yeah. It feels it feels different from autopilot. Okay. Like autopilot holds the wheel very rigidly, and you have to apply a lot of force to like get it out of the autopilot. You get used to it after driving yeah. for a while. When, when you get used to it, and you know, yeah, you know exactly how to do it. But like open pilot's very our our torque policy is very different from that. We will not fight you at all. You can we we when we detect any human torque on the wheel, we ramp down our torque in proportion, so you can like. If it's going a little too much right, you can just gently nudge the wheel to the left and it'll go back. Like, it works. The steering is more cooperative cooperative than one person's in charge and the other person's in charge. I like that. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting to explore different kind of UI models for that, you know. There's just kind of like this one, you know, product on the market, but people haven't really explored different ways to kind of build products for people, different user interfaces there. I don't know, like, yeah, I prefer the open pilot one to the autopilot one, but I think I think it's mostly a matter of opinion. Um, I also don't like, like, autopilot will separate adaptive cruise from auto steer. Like, we don't do any of that. It's either on or off. So what are the other things that you think about autopilot, like how, how it can be improved? Oh, uh, how autopilot, how autopilot can be improved? Well, so I think that, well, I'll start with, like, what I think it does well. It does better than... It feels more like locked on rails than our system. It feels more like you're you're just like driving on a on, on a rail. Um, it also right now has a significantly better longitudinal policy than us. Like it's better at mergers and stuff. We're not very good at mergers. We're not good at like detecting the car over here, um, which Autopilot's gotten a lot better at in like the last year. Uh, but yeah, I feel that it like the few times that I did have it mess up on my road trip, it messed up pretty badly. That the, the the flip side, the trade-off to that locked-on feeling is it'll feel just as locked on as it drives you into a wall. Open pilot feels less confident when it's less confident. Because we, we pass the model output, you know, more into the uh like or we're closer to the model. So like when it's a little unsure, it kinda, you know, it feels a little jittery. Whereas autopilot feels rock solid even when it's completely unsure. Even when it's completely doing the wrong thing. So I mean that's a trade-off. Um, I think that the, dis- the driver monitoring is vastly superior to the wheel touch. Um, though, yeah, I mean, the wheel touch. At first, the first time I, I, used, uh, I used autopilot, I thought that you had to touch the wheel. And I hated it because I accidentally disengaged it like so many times. Uh, and then when you, t- when you touch the knob, it's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. It's hard for people to figure out how to hold it just right. Not too yeah. gentle, not too soft. Right. Like you said, I think we're still, still a ways away. No, like getting good enough, it'll never get good enough. Eventually, Tesla is going to put some infrared LEDs on their new Model 3s, and those ones are going to have driver monitoring and buy the new one that has driver monitoring. That's definitely what's going to happen. They will eventually come around to driver monitoring. It just may be uh, a while. So you don't think that full self-driving will be before that? No way! Well, it depends what you call full self-driving. You mean self-driving where you don't have to pay attention? No way. No way. I bet I bet ten grand right now that... Uh, Tesla ships driver monitoring before they ship anything where you don't have to pay attention. Well, no, if you mean full self-driving, like navigate on autopilot will make a right turn at a red light, and that might ship first. Sure. That's not that hard. Yeah. Right. But now make that right turn, you know, do it a million times and don't mess up. Ooh, well. Yeah. That's the thing is people confuse supervised autonomy with unsupervised autonomy. One's vastly harder than the other. Well, they're this. I mean, there's no categorical difference. It's just a question about how often it messes up. Reliability, yeah. So I had, so uh, yeah, like I'd say autopilot messed up pretty badly once every hundred miles. Like once every hundred miles, if I didn't correct it, I would have crashed. 
So, you know, it, they weren't like like huge things that I could usually see them coming. And and was that like um, involving other vehicles or was it just like on its own? Usually involving other vehicles. Usually involving other vehicles doing dumb stuff. <laughs> so maybe maybe we'll wrap it up and yeah, it's been it's been such a good time having you you know, having you on our show George. It's been real fun chatting with you. I hope you've had a good time as well. What's the website for people who want to, you know, get a comma or try it out? comma.ai Comment it out. There you go. All right. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. Nice. Thurro Tesla signing off. Yeah.